Ethical Perspectives on the News is produced by the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, which is solely responsible for its content. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of KCRG TV9. Good morning. My name is Martha Rogers, and welcome to this episode of Ethical Perspectives on the News. Boy, I have kind of been out of the loop lately. My husband was pretty sick a few weeks ago. In fact, um, he had pink eye. Now, you might say that's not pretty sick, but um, he went and got some medicine for it, and then the doctor realized, oh, you had bronchitis a few weeks ago. And if you're going to travel to Canada tomorrow, I think I'll put you back on your antibiotic. So my husband went to the pharmacy, took his antibiotic, went home, and ended up in six days of intensive care. Mm. He had severe anaphylactic shock. But I still think the doctors made a really good call. He, he had an unusual reaction. But laying there in the hospital bed gave me an opportunity to remember a question that I've carried in the back of my mind for years. How do we use medicine in our society? And are, have we become or are we becoming an over-medicated society? It's hard to know. So we've invited three experts here this morning to join our panel, and I'd like to introduce you to them. With me today is Dick Sockwell, a psychologist here in Cedar Rapids. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Good morning. Welcome. And Kristen Richardson is next to Dick, and she's a, with the Holistic Mental Health Care as a psychiatric nurse practitioner. Mm -hmm. Welcome. I'm Thank glad you. you're with us. Next to Kristen is Michael Fuam. Professor of Clinical Psychology and Director of the Division of Public and Community Psychiatry at the University of Iowa. Welcome. I appreciate you all being here um, this morning, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to use medicine, and I'm grateful for the advances in medicine, and I'm, I'm grateful for the way we try to work towards more holistic medicine and teaming and communication. But my first question to you this morning has to deal with the term over-medicated. Um, I did some research for the program, and sometimes people were saying, that's just a catchphrase of the media. And then I saw some very many statistics, um, even from the disease prevention centers and such, that said, no, we are becoming over-medicated. So I'm going to throw it to you. What does the term over-medicated mean in, in your opinions? Dick, you want to start us out? Okay, yeah, of course I'm coming from the mental health field and so I can only speak to my opinions on that, but I, uh, it's been my feeling for um, oh, many, many, many years that um, uh, there's uh, probably too much medication and too frequently given in the mental health field. I think there is a perception on some people's part that the um, solution to mental health problems lies in medis medicine and of course that's not true. That's not to say that I think medicine is a bad thing. I don't at all. I think it's a good thing. But um, if it's used as the primary approach to the mental health problems such as depression, anxiety, and so forth, um, it's probably not, uh, it's not going to be as effective and I think all the research would point to this as uh, therapy and medication. Um, Unfortunately, many people who go to their physicians and are prescribed medication for mental health reasons uh, are never referred on uh, for evaluation for possible therapy that would be beneficial, and I think uh, that's, uh, that's, that's tragedy. Such as cognitive therapy or behavioral exactly. therapy, or mm -hmm. what? I'm not sure of all the terminology. Nope, exactly right. Yes, exactly. Kristen and Michael, what do you think um, the term represents when we just throw it out there about being over-medicated? Yeah, I agree. I um, both prescribe medications and do psychotherapy. Um, so I'm always encouraging people to, you know, really use therapy as the primary support for them and using medication as something to use in addition to that or even maybe try therapy first before doing medication. And people really like their medication so it sometimes isn't the provider that is the one initiating. Sometimes people come in and they feel like the solution for them is gonna be medication. So I always try to really educate them, spend time with them, give them other options because sometimes they don't even know what those other options are and just make sure they're really well informed and really pushing the, the therapy end. So, Michael, do you address this at the university with over-medicated? We certainly do. And I would like to say that 
everything that I will say here today reflect my opinion. And I am not a spokesman for anybody, and I'm probably a bit of an outlier among my peers. Um, and, and I think we probably have more consensus than disagreement, but I, this issue is such an important issue, and I'll, I'll cut to the chase. I think there's no question that we will look back on this era, and we will all recognize that we are too quick to go to medications in general. However, I think it's really important that we not think about are medications good, are they bad, should they be used first, should they not be used first, and rather recognize that there's a, a spectrum of patients. We saw a patient in the emergency room today, three hours ago, okay? I will tell you that whatever you do for this person, I think cognitive therapy, the right nutrition, the right exercise. This woman had a florid mania, and I think that most of what is going to get her better, at least over the short term, is the appropriate medication or somatic treatment. Okay? So I am an active proponent, and I think there are people that we see for whom the right medication is, in fact, the most important predictor of how they're going to be. Here's the bottom line, though. If you look at the distribution, that is the exception rather than the expectation of the, out of 100 patients that I will encounter, maybe five of them will fit in that category. Probably 50 to 70 of them what's going to predict their outcome is going to be a lot more complicated than just getting the meds right. And our system likes to be very black and white. So we are in an era now where we like to see everything one way or the other. And so rather than saying, well, there's this broad spectrum, and what's right for person A is not necessarily right for person B, we sort of say, I'm pro-medication, I'm anti it doesn't work like that. Now, unfortunately, psychiatry has allowed itself to be narrowed down so that many of my colleagues think of themselves as their reason to be is to be the medication guys. I personally think that's a threat to the field as a whole. Is it not also a threat to the patient? Absolutely. Yeah. Because, I, again, for my money, the modal patient that I see, i.e. the majority of patients that I see, while medication may play a role, is it primary? No. Are we over-prescribing because that's what we do? Yes. Well, I think of insurance and how they would like to see some results quickly or have the cut mold. Patient A shows up with this. This is the result. And I also think of, like, the media with um, the ads now for all these medications. So a patient would come in expecting, as you said, Kristen, mm -hmm. well, what's going to make me better is what I saw on the TV ad and yeah. or what I read in a magazine, so me, and I'm me, not going to be happy or well until I get that. Let me comment on that, if I will, because this is actually a personal... Do you know how many countries allow direct marketing of pharmaceuticals? I guess I've never thought of that. But I Anybody? bet you know. I know. Two. Really? The United States and New Zealand, a country of four million people. Mm. So other than four million people, the rest of the world has the wisdom not to do that. There's great data that suggests that if a person walks into a doctor's office knowing what they want, they're much more likely to come out with a prescription for that. Well, in my mind, I used to work with a lot of home intervention and behavioral things. And I can remember if people knew what they thought they wanted for an end result, like a medication, they would show the symptoms. They would mm -hmm. almost convince them. Do you, do you mm -hmm. find that in, the, in your medical fields? So, the, so we're trying to please the insurance companies. We're trying to get the patient yeah. healthier. You're trying to please what the patient would work with. And I think sometimes what happens is, you know, somebody comes in in a lot of emotional pain and the provider isn't sure what to do. You know, they want to try to help. And I think that because medication is usually on the top of people's list of things, 
they're like, oh, okay, here's some medication. You know, I hope this helps you feel better because we're not, we don't have a lot of discussion around, well, what are the other things that we can do to support a fellow human being that's in pain? What would be some of those things? What, what I do is really, I do my best to just be, you know, come from a place of equality with this person. I do a lot of work on my own emotions. I really focus on myself and my own emotional health. And so when I'm presented with somebody in pain, I usually feel really comfortable, you know, to just help support them and talk with them about what is really going on for them, to really sit with them and have a, you know, a human to human discussion about what really is this pain, what's going on. And when I talk with them about it and help, them, help support them with seeing what the pain is and they can really like express it and see how it's affecting their life and get clarity around it, then they're more able to make changes. Lifestyle changes. Lifestyle changes and be aware of their emotions and what they do when they're feeling, you know, this kind of out of control emotions and how to gain perspective on it and, and make a healthy choice when that pain is there. So I help people with identifying, getting clarity on the pain and, and supporting them with how do I make a healthy choice when that pain is really deep? What do I do? So I think sometimes we're so quick because people are like, I don't know what to do, you know, with this pain. This is a lot of pain this person's in. So I think sometimes medication too quickly gets, you know, thrown out there. Or too long of a period as you make yeah. the transition to lifestyle change if the, the person can help do that. Yeah, because my experience is when I support people, um, they can make those changes within themselves that they'll often turn to medication to do for them, like with anxiety, for example, where they can work on their own emotional awareness and really like gain control over over those experiences over time yeah thank you mm -hmm. D does all this um lead to us wanting maybe prescription drugs to numb some of the pain that's in the world do doc I, i've never been a doctor so do doctors prescribe um to help numb the pain i don't think they want to numb the pain i i've said for many many years that if you walk into any family practice a doctor's office in the country and you have anything but an identifiable medical problem, you'll probably walk out with an antidepressant um, if you have any emotional stuff. And, you know, most of them aren't equipped to understand exactly what's going on and they believe that antidepressants are what you should do for depression when really the clinical evidence and many uh, studies indicate that it's not very effective. Um, most people are depressed uh, well, some, there is a genetic component for some of the depressions, but most of the people who are depressed are depressed because they're not coping with reality very well. And if I give them a medication and they believe that that's going to help, then that's what they do. I've had people referred to me by doctors and psychiatrists because they weren't comfortable just using medication, which is great. And maybe, and not many, but some of the people will come in and say, you know, I don't want to do therapy. I just, I, medication's all I need. And I try to help them understand that, you know, that may be a, enough for you, maybe not. But learning how to manage your life, learning how to deal with the stresses in your life without getting into a depressed or an anxious state uh, is probably going to be a whole lot more effective over the long run than any medication that they can take. Um, but although, you learn the norm, normalcy of having some of those situations in life, anxiety, yeah. depression, sadness. But I, I wanted to oh, make one other me. point, and that is that I, I don't want to leave the impression with anyone that I believe that medication is bad. I don't. Um, it's just that, as I had said earlier, you know, we really need to have um, you know, a look at helping people understand how can I manage my life. You and I are living in the same world. We walk on the same uh, sidewalks and drive the same streets, and yet some people on a spectrum will be just terribly, terribly depressed, and others will be okay and very happy, and there's some genetic stuff in there, but uh, many of the differences between the folks in terms of their moods and so forth is that uh, some people are just better at coping with some of the stressors emotionally than others are. But people, all people have the opportunity or the hope to learn. Well, how you can to learn, and that's what it is I do, and that's what mm -hmm. Kristen does as well, is teach you how do you deal with that so you don't have to be so depressed. Or, or so medicated. Or, absolutely. Michael, you wanted to say something. Well, in, in terms of the data that you were talking about, I think there, are, there have been some very important studies that have looked at um, the literature on the efficacy of antidepressants, for example. And... The finding really is not that they're not so effective, but that it's, they're really only effective 
for the more severe end of depression. And they're, they're, they're not terribly effective for, for the less severe depression. But again, it's so tempting to just try to be on one side of this debate or the other. And all I can tell you is that I, I, I do feel like there are patients with depression who, with all of the best kinds of things that you guys might offer, are still not going to get there. But again, the, the thing is, is that that's the minority case. And most of the people that we see, um, the various things that go into all of our wellness, what makes us okay? You know, the, the, the former head of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, which is the federal agency that oversees mental health and substance abuse. He used to talk about recovery-oriented outcomes. What are we looking for for our patients? You know what he used to say? He used to say, a decent job, a place called home, and a date on Saturday night. With a the, little independence Those are in. the <laughs> outcomes that most humans are looking for, myself included. Um, how are we bringing, and, and to what extent are if someone walks into my office, to what extent am I helping them achieve those outcomes by giving them yet another medication? For most of the patients that I see, medications play a relatively small role in helping them achieve those outcomes. For a minority of patients that I see, medications are the single most important answer. Unfortunately, though, for, for those that don't fit that smaller major, major, minority, excuse me, we want too quick of a fix. We don't want to look at um, being able to fund as a nation um, mental health programs, mm -hmm. exercise programs, education. Um, you know, diet one, and of, nutrition. one of my yeah. con diet and nutrition. One of my concerns is how we medicate children, mm -hmm. and um, how quickly some parents want that rather than maybe looking at behavioral um, teaching or interventions, and what parenting means and. I'm sure you all have opinions. You're giving me a funny face. No. Am I opening up a can of worms no, by bringing up medicating children? I don't think so. Children? I think it's exactly right. I mean, uh, it isn't just adults. It's children, too. Uh, children behave as they behave for reasons. Some of those are genetic, but most of them are not. They're about learned behavior. I've always said that uh, children's behavior is sort of like one definition of a gas. It will expand to fill whatever volume you put it in. If as parents we set our expectations out here, the children are going to act all the way out there. If we put them in here, they're going to behave in there. Both negative and positive. Absolutely. And um, one of the things, I did get a lot of referrals for children with behavior problems, acting out and so forth. And I never, never work with those children. It's a waste of time. I work with the parents. Oh, very the good. The parents need to learn how to manage these children's behavior. And, and it's just it's silly to, to send a child like that to a therapist, in my opinion, and yet this is done all the time. Or they medicate the child for ADHD when, in fact, what they have is oppositional behavior. But then again, we have to be careful because there are certain instances where the medication is um, needed and is, is yes. very, very helpful. For attention deficit, but not for oppositional behavior, it has no impact on that at all. And so, uh, anyway, my point is medication can be used at times, but man, oh man, with the children, I think you need to really have parents learning how to manage them. I used to teach parent education, so I couldn't agree with there you, you more. Yeah, and I, I look at some of the way our culture has changed, too, and I think I th I'm beginning to wonder if our culture needs medication. Yeah. But, you know, you talked about funding it. You know, there are really wonderful evidence-based treatments for oppositional defiant disorder in young kids doing exactly what you're talking about, mm -hmm. right? One is called parent-child interaction therapy, where you literally coach a parent with a little bug in their ear from a two-way mirror mm. watching play, in, and, and teach them how to get, how to be a better parent. And it's an evidence-based treatment that is clearly effective. It's hard, it's labor intensive, it takes a long time, and you have to fight with insurance companies sometimes in order to, 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 
to pay for it because sometimes it's not necessarily dealing with the kid, it's dealing with the parents. Mm -hmm. Well, then you're getting into family systems theory rather than right. situational. This child is having this problem, so let's do this. But the good news is that I think we are moving more toward those kinds of things. Those, those kinds of treatments are being more widely disseminated. They're getting more reimbursed. What's some of this collateral damage then of being in a society that could be considered over-medicated? We're talking about children and behavioral things. We're talking about family systems and how parents can work as parents. But what about even just the basis of over-medicating um, and giving prescriptions so frequently that we're polluting the earth mm -hmm. or we're avoiding death and overcrowding the earth? I think way too far on this, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, that, that gets further down the road than and I think we even need to get because let's look at the, let's look a little bit closer. So one of the things that many of these medications do is cause a lot of weight gain. Mm -hmm. So the modal patient that I see is on disability, sees their job as being a professional psychiatric patient, mm. has nothing meaningful to do, is grossly obese, um, is not attending to that, is not exercising, is not having a fulfilling life. So in terms of the sort of collateral damage, part of what it is is, is that these medicines um, do have meaningful side effects that are really having significant health risks. Mm -hmm. And that's really the case in kids as well. And then the problem's so cyclic then, it keeps coming back on itself, because if you're obese and you have some side effects of weight gain, then you don't want to exercise, right. or it's more painful, and then you get more depressed, or, you know, mm -hmm. I can't imagine all those. What other collateral damages are there to our society or to the world with being over-medicated or so quick to have prescription drugs? I, to, to piggyback on what Michael said, you know, we get people who, come in with the, the, the psychological problems, get medicated, the medication doesn't make them okay, and they begin to see themselves as stuck. They begin to see themselves as this is what I'm gonna be for the rest of my life, I'm gonna be depressed, I'm gonna be anxious, I'm not gonna be able to function. And then of course you have that cascading effect of the self-esteem and the, how I look at myself and more depression and you get that sort of death right. spiral thing going. And it becomes self-fulfilling. Yeah, so I think having reasonable expectations for the medication is one of the things I preach to my clients all the time. It's not gonna undepress you. I've been in this business 40 years and I've never had a person yet who was depressed and became undepressed by taking antidepressant medication. See, now, and that's happen. different than me. I've had plenty of patients who have dramatic improvement yeah. with appropriate medication treatment. But again, of the full mm -hmm. distribution of patients I see, 5%, 10%. Just the toxicity of putting those chemicals in people's bodies and the effects of that with overall health, I think it really affects them, yeah. They have side effects. Yeah. I try to tell my clients, you know, the doctor prescribes you a medication for this reason whatever that reason is. But you know, the medication doesn't know that and your body doesn't know that and they're gonna interact in whatever way they interact. And um, you know, it, and then we get people on so many medications. I've, no, it's not unusual for me to have a person come in who's on six or seven different psychiatric med medications. I read, uh, I read some statistics from oh, the AMA you? today and they said the average American that's age 45 to 65 is probably on five medications. Huh. One per decade. Yeah. That's the <laughs> usual. <laughs> really? No, seriously, that's, that's our average, about a medication I per I can remember wow. my parents were on none. Yeah, sure. And so that's where I say I get confused because I'm thankful for the advances that help me with medications, but wow. I can go, I'm a pastor, so I go into many homes, and I see many of our people hiring people just to come in and set out their medications because they can't control they the confused. numbers of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So where do you think we're heading? What do you think might be uh, some kind of solution? What, what final word of advice would you give? It's hopeless. <laughs> no. <laughs> you we, live, no. we live in a culture of Fox News or, or, or MSNBC, right? You gotta be over here or over here. Mm -hmm. Obviously what we need is balance, mm -hmm. but we are terrible at that as a culture. But helping to support people with learning that, learning what does balance look like, what does it feel like, um, so I think more and more people are looking at the here, this I want to have a balanced life, 
and they're seeking that out in various ways. That sometimes it's outside of medicine that they're learning that, though. So it the, isn't within medicine. So the a lot balance of times. is to use the medicine that's prescribed appropriately, but then also look at the lifestyle yes. changes or education for parenting or um, yeah. spending time with your children rather than electronics and using other placebos or medicines. Yeah, in the looking way. at it from the whole perspective of every aspect of life. Yeah, a holistic rather than one. Yeah. I think, too, the uh, training of the physicians is an important place to look. My daughter happens to be in a third year of medical school, and, I, and I, I'm hoping that what they're trying to teach people is that there's more than medication, that you really do need to bring in some of these other people, uh, you know, who can do the therapy, who can look at other aspects, who can, you know, help them in other ways, and so that the physicians we're turning out don't just see themselves as the answer and that medication therefore is the answer. It's the only but it, answer. it's yeah. not only a training issue. If, for example, 15 minute psychiatric visits are seen as the standard of care, mm -hmm. that is setting it up. Yes. 15 minutes for a psychiatric visit. That is the standard Six of care. Six to eight care. minutes for general practitioners. I can't even yeah. get my history out in six minutes at my age. But you're likely to get a prescription. Yes. Yeah. And I, by choice, see people for at least 60 minutes for my appointments. Just, you know, by choice, I do that. I don't make as much money what? as what? I would if I did yeah. the 15-minute appointments, but that doesn't matter to me. It's a personal choice that I make. So I'm hearing the, the approach that would be the healthiest for all to take is for us to, to use our medicines appropriate, um, talk to our physicians, talk to our mental health professionals, and learn on how we uh, learn um, and take the responsibility right. for how we can learn for ourselves right. and our families and our loved ones other approaches, the diet, the exercise, um, a little of this and a little of that. And what to do with the emotions when they come up. Because they will take come responsibility up. for learning what can I do to help support right. myself when that pain is there. And sometimes it's through the pain of life that we grow the most. Yes. So I would like to see us grow together as a society rather than keep numbing yeah. it. And pain right. is not necessarily an illness. Yes. Right. That's true. Pain is not an illness. Well, thank you for being here this morning. I, I so appreciate everything you're doing for the people of our communities um, through education, through clinic work, through holistic approaches, and through education, as you mentioned, you do also. I don't think there are any simple answers to the questions of whether there are too many medications prescribed or too many diagnoses too casually given. But I'm glad we're asking those questions, and I'm glad we can faithfully step back and maybe look at the complications we have in our society, especially in mental health. I think psychology and psychology has come a long, long way in recent years. But I think we not only owe it to ourselves and the children and the parents we have now, I think we owe it to generations to come to start changing some of our own behavior patterns um, so that we're not too dependent upon chemistry and I really hope that we don't sacrifice character development in the process, that we become responsible people rather than a dependent society. This all makes me wonder if we've even started um, really addressing the, the full issue of being an over-medicating society. Um, the behavior of our society and the ills of our society are still gonna be challenging to us as individuals, and maybe it's together through clinic work, through counseling, through education, that we all can improve. But I think that's another show, and mm -hmm. I think that's another panel discussion. So on behalf of the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, the sponsors of this program, I thank you for joining us this morning, and I thank you all for being here, too. Thanks. Thank you. Hope thank you. to have you on another panel. Goodbye. <laughs>